What is up party people? I'm trying to record this like in a decent way, but the lighting is not working with me at all. Here we are in Zephaniah. So in chapter one of Zephaniah, we went through in the overview kind of some of the themes of Zephaniah where it's about this day of the Lord and coming judgment and these different themes, how the prophets fit together, some of the reasons I like studying the prophets. So we're going to jump into it here. In chapter one, I'm going to try this again. I did this a little bit in Genesis, but I'm going to do it a little bit different than I did there. So we're going to just jump in and see how this goes. The word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, son of Gedali, Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. So right off the bat, we see something interesting here about Zephaniah. If you didn't catch the overview, Zephaniah is a pre-exile prophet, which means he's telling Judah to repent. He's telling them there's an exile coming, God's judgment, you can get out of it. If you're humble, if you're, here's what's going to happen. So a prophet is telling something that's going to happen. But in this case, he's actually saying, please repent. Please give these things up. Be humble before God and turn yourself around. Obviously they don't and there's a judgment for it. But this is before that. And an interesting thing about Zephaniah here is that Zephaniah is the son of Hezekiah in the days of Josiah. Now, this points to Zephaniah maybe being of a royal bloodline, which would be kind of an interesting person to be a prophet, I think. Going on, we see a picture of the day of the Lord, the judgment of the day of the Lord. I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and the rubble. There's a note here we're going to talk about the rubble with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants, inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off from this place the remnant of Baal and the name of the idolatrous priests, along with the priests, those who bow down on the roofs to the host of the heavens, those who bow down and swear to the Lord, and yet swear by Milcom, those who have turned back from following the Lord, who do not seek the Lord or inquire of him. So there's a picture of judgment here. I, I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth. And again, this harkens back to things like Noah's flood. It harkens forward to the day of judgment when the wheat and the chaff are going to be separated and the chaff is going to be burned up. Uh, but this is sweep away everything from the face of the earth. Like this is a physical destruction. Then I like this in verse three, I will sweep away man and beast, birds and the fish and the rubble. So it's, it's almost like a decreation. It's going from the top down man and beast, which were later creations, earlier creations of birds and the fish. And then all the way down to the rubble with the wicked, this, even earthen, uh, and it says stumbling blocks here. This idea of idols time and time again is shown that the idols are made out of earth or metal or wood. They're not living. They're really base elements that people are dressing up. They're putting lipstick on a pig here. They're just meaningless, lifeless idols. And so it's saying that You know, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to cut off this place from the people who didn't worship me and who worshiped idols. In verse 7, the day of the Lord is near. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. And on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire. On that day, I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold and those who fill their master's house with violence and fraud. So it's saying in a step further and saying that you need to recognize that this day is coming. It's closer than you think. And the people that don't put God first are going to be wiped down. It's it's pretty clear. If you're trying to worship idols and God, that doesn't cut it. He's a jealous God. There's only one God worthy of worship. On that day, declares the Lord, a cry will be heard from the fish gate 
a wail from the second quarter, a loud crash from the hills. Wail, O inhabitants of the mortar, for all the traitors are no more. All who weigh out silver are cut off. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are complacent, those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. Their gods will be plundered, and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. So this is a very interesting passage. This section here, 10 through 11, on that day, a uh, cry from the fish gate. A fish gate is where there was a lot of uh, buying and selling of fish. The fish gate is where that would happen. It was a marketplace. The second quarter was a marketplace. The mortar was, uh, I believe, a place in Jerusalem that was kind of like a bowl. And it was also a marketplace. So these people that are putting profit and trade, there is a, a pretty infamous situation at the fish gate where people were uh, circumventing the Sabbath. They were going to the fish gate and selling and buying fish and trading on the Sabbath when they shouldn't have. All of these things, God is saying, you didn't put these things first. You didn't put me first. And because of that, you're going to be plundered. All these things that you're building up are going to be torn down. You're not going to, you're going to build houses. You're going to have vineyards. You're going to, but you're never going to see the fruit of your labor. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud. A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. So again, we're seeing like this, this is battle language. This is not just passive language. This is a battle is coming. The lines are drawn out. It's going to be a day of wrath. I will bring distress on mankind so that they will, they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them on the day of the wrath of the Lord. And the fire of his jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed for a full and sudden end. He will make of all of the inhabitants of the earth. So he's going through here and just laying it out and saying, these are the types of people. It's these people that aren't putting God first. It's because they haven't been putting God first. It's a punishment because of their rebellion. And it's going through and saying, I'm a jealous God. I'm not going to allow you to do this, go down this path of worshiping other idols and, and worshiping me. This really stands out to me today because... When I look around America right now, there are all kinds of idols being propped up and uh, compared with God. And there are one thing that really stood out <clears throat> is this verse. Where is it? And I will punish the men who are complacent. Those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. This kind of universalist Christianity where people are rejecting that God's judgment is coming or they're not calling out the evil around them, those people are complacent. They're not humbly submitting themselves to God and saying that God, I would rather face God's wrath in a righteous fashion than go along with the sin around me. It's just not happening. It's the complacent people who say God will not do good and he's not going to do bad. God's just kind of there. And that's just not the case. So I think chapter one is very important in setting up this idea of the day of the Lord because there are consequences. The whole point of the day of the Lord and the whole reason that the story of the gospel is so compelling is that people deserve God's wrath. The people would choose God's wrath. It's not even like a thing that God has to force on humanity. Humanity will drink from the cup of God's wrath. That's their nature. That's their intended choice. They're, they can't be good. They cannot be holy or uh, set apart apart from God. And so uh, I think that's kind of an interesting thing. One other thing that I'm going to pour out uh, or uh, talk about is I, it was very fascinating to me to read the, you know, verses 10 through 13, where it talks about the reasons, the types of people that God is going to punish and why. It's not going to be your strength or your wealth that saves you here. It is going to be God disciplining the, a nation for their national sin. One thing that I will point out before the 
the end of the video is these patterns and the prophecies are personal patterns as well as family patterns as well as national patterns so when we look at this the judgment here is happens for every person that gets converted to christ every single person is convinced of their own sin and depravity that's why they need saving that's why they turn to jesus without that recognition that there is a judgment coming and that they deserve wrath or punishment for the evil that they've done they're not going to respect the grace being extended by god they're not going to appreciate it they're not going to there there's, has to be an understanding here of one side of the, the day of the lord compared to the other and the first side is that there is a judgment that there is a judgment and there's a righteous judge who's going to give you what you deserve the flip side of that is that he also is determined that you don't have to perish eternally that you can choose to glorify him by going through the process of sanctification by putting your faith in Jesus Christ the the offering that was sent to make us right with God he bridged that gap that we couldn't bridge on our own for us i just think it's so powerful because a lot of times we hear people preaching the compassion and love of God and we hear very little about God's judgment these days but Zephaniah is laying it on pretty thick here which i i really love so there's chapter 1 in the next video we're going to go through chapter 2 and chapter 3 verses 1 through 8 and we'll jump into that but that's all i have for today so uh yeah think about that idea of the day of the lord and what that idea brings to your head what what that's like and um with that i'll catch you in the next video put a comment down below if there was something especially interesting that stood out about this chapter to you as you read through it and like it and subscribe to catch all the videos as they come out and uh yeah we'll keep this party rolling all right i'll catch you soon peace